So welcome everyone to the world of non-unions and osteomyelitis. As you know, you've heard full 45 minute talks on each of these topics, so this should be interesting. So we'll start off with non-unions. Uh, it's when the normal biological healing process of the bone ceases. It used to be defined along a timeline where there was uh, no, or failure to unite within six to nine months was considered a delayed union and failure to unite after nine months was considered a non-union. This is no longer the acceptable definition, however. Now the current definition is just that a non-union is failure of progression of healing with no change in serial x-rays over three months and some or some additional intervention is required for healing, and a delayed union is just the speed of the fracture healing is slower than anticipated. So what causes non-unions? Multiple factors, including host factors, local factors, and then also severity of injury. So some things you can do something about, some you can't. So the host factors, diabetes, smoking, nutritional status, medications, NSAIDs are still sort of a yes, no. Uh, the, uh, based on the lab studies, the uh, dosage that you would have to take to really be a problem is more than anyone would ever take, but it's still on the list there. Uh, and metabolic or endocrine abnormalities such as thyroid abnormalities or vitamin D deficiency. Local factors include the soft tissue injury. Obviously, you have an injury like this on the right. You're going to have a hard time getting that bone to heal. And then also just the local blood supply or your compromised vascular supply. Also, infection obviously can affect union presence of any interposed tissue. If you look at this tibial nail here and you notice a big gap right in the back there, there's probably something in there that could interfere with the healing. And then also inadequate reduction or excessive fracture at motion. And then, of course, the severity of the injury. Open fractures have a higher non-union rate than closed. You've lost the periosteal or external soft tissue blood supply. And also, if they're high-energy injuries. Common unit injuries can uh, lead to non-union, as well as if there's been an inadequate debridement of devitalized soft tissues with an open fracture. So here's an example of one with significant bone loss. Obviously, there, there's no way that's going to heal without some sort of intervention. Poor bony contact, even though there's not bone loss, the bone is not uh, in continuity. Inadequate fixation. On the bottom right here, you see this femur in a 15-year-old that was fixed with flexible nails. That's doomed to failure. And also just poor surgical technique or decision-making in the initial stabilization and treatment of the fracture, as illustrated on the right. And then also in this plateau fracture, or sorry, the distal femur fracture, where this plate is fracture was never reduced, and uh, this is not a locking plate. So this was just a poor decision making here. So can be the fault of the surgeon as well. So how do we classify these? You classify non-unions based on the vascularity, the viability as determined by the vascularity, and stability. A hypertrophic non-union has adequate vascularity, inadequate stability. So you get an abundant callus formation, and you'll get widening of the fracture site. What's happening is there's a failure of the fibrocartilage uh, mineralization, so you develop this elephant's foot or horse's hoof that it's sometimes called. So these are very recognizable on x-ray. An oligotrophic uh, is sort of an in-between where there's adequate vascularity. Your bone ends are viable, but there's just not enough stability, and there's, but there's less motion with the hypertrophic non-union. So you, it looks like it's trying really hard to heal, but it's just not quite making it. And then you have the atrophic non-union. That's obviously poor vascularity, and it can be with or without inadequate stability. Sometimes the stability is fine, but just the vascularity is poor enough that it will never heal. And then also there's obviously infected non-unions, and that can be any of those three types. So how do you diagnose these? Obviously, clinically, they'll have pain, they'll have motion, radiographically, and you always have to get labs with non-unions. You always have to think about an infection. So you want CBC, ESR, CRP. In your radiographic workup, get plain films first. A lot of times people jump straight to a CT scan or an MRI. A lot of times the plain films can give you all the information that you need. You certainly want to get the entire bone. You want to get uh, the AP and lateral and oblique views of the non-union site can also help you determine what's going on. And what you're looking for, the radiographic definition of healing, is three out of four healed quarter disease. The CT scan can then be useful to assess the non-union site. Any rotational deformities, you see this one in the middle where it's showing the rotation 
at the uh, plateau and then also down here at the plafond. So that can be helpful to figure that out. And then also lung length discrepancies uh, can be uh, determined using a CT scan. Bone scan can still be useful to assess nonunion in the presence of hardware and you can add indium or gallium scan for infection. So you see right here in the distal tibia, the bone has lit up right in that area. This is looking at it from the front and then that's the PA view of it there. And the MRI uh, can be used to assess the extent of infection in infected nonunion. So the first part of your strategy is to admit to yourself that the patient actually has a nonunion. You need to determine the cause of that nonunion if you can, understand the personality of the nonunion, and then correct the problem. So first you need to determine the mechanism of failure. Was it mechanical, biological, or a combined mechanism? Then you need to optimize your results with adequate stability, deformity correction if needed, early range of motion, and weight bearing. You want to make sure you don't end up with an unusable limb, even with a healed bone. So your treatment options, obviously, there's always non-operative. Um, typically, that doesn't have much of a role in non-unions. Uh, bone growth stimulators still are more sort of voodoo than anything scientifically shown to really work. Um, some people have uh, touted the benefits of hyperbaric oxygen, but the mainstay of non-union treatment is operative. So with a hypertrophic nonunion, you have good biology, you have poor stability. So you need to provide rigid mechanical stability and you'll get a rapid biological response when you do that. You decrease motion, micro motion at the nonunion site that then allows capillary ingrowth within chondral, endochondral ossification. And you really don't need bone grafting with a hypertrophic nonunion because you have good biology. In an oligotrophic nonunion, you need rigid stability, you need to reduce the bony fragments to improve the bone contact, and bone grafting is helpful with an oligotrophic nonunion because you usually will have some bony gaps that need uniting, or need bridging, sorry. And then with an atrophic nonunion, you have bad biology and bad stability. So you, uh, you need a biological stimulus. You need the stability, you need the bone graft, and the revascularization is going to occur slowly over several months. You may also need to resect an avascular segment in an atrophic nonunion. If you look at this right here, this distal tibia, this is never going to heal. So you've got to get rid of that before you can even think about getting this thing to heal. And then in synovial pseudoarthrosis, you'll get a synovial line cavity between the non-united fracture fragments. There's actual fluid present in the cavity, and there's this lining, and so you need to resect the lining and the cavity, regardless of what additional type of treatment you're going to pursue after that. In infected nonunion, the main thing is you have to eradicate the infection. If you don't get the infection to go away, you're not going to get the bones to unite. Then you treat the nonunion. It may require multiple surgeries. It may require multiple techniques. There's no one set treatment protocol. It has to be based on whatever the fracture pattern is that you're dealing with, the nonunion, and what's going on with the patient. And then obviously circular ring external fixation, and you'll be happy to know this is the only thing I'm gonna say about this, is just that it's indicated in instances when you have bone loss, shortening, need for multiplanar deformity correction, infected nonunions, and also with patient factors where you just don't have the appropriate soft tissue envelope or anything like that in order to expect any adequate healing. So your pearls in dealing with nonunions is that you need to achieve stable fixation that allows motion at joints above and below the nonunion. A healthy, well-vascularized soft tissue envelope is essential. If you have a persistent nonunion, you need to look for other problems. Metabolic, uh, NSAIDs, which can prevent calcification of the osteoid matrix, and tobacco use. And then obviously, osteomyelitis would be the next big problem that you're looking at. So the incidence of osteomyelitis, is it's a major problem worldwide. Uh, in the U.S., its uh, incidence in epidemiology is a little unclear. It's always difficult to get reporting on this. It's more common in males than females, probably because trauma is more common in males than females. Significantly increased incidence over age 60. And part of this is because of the increasing number of comorbidities in these patients. The incidence of fracture-associated bone infection uh, varies from 1.8% to 27%, depending on the bone involved. And if it's an open fracture, the type of open fracture, obviously the incidence goes up from a type 1. So risk factors 
are, again, just as with the non-unions, they can be patient factors, they can be uh, factors related to the injury. There's ones that can be helped, ones that can't. Diabetes, uh, kidney disease, hemoglobinopathies, uh, rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory arthritis, immunocompromised state, vascular insufficiency, long-term steroid use, all patient factors that uh, are really difficult to control. And then penetrating trauma, open fracture, and IV drug abuse also are risks for osteomyelitis. Usually it's due to direct inoculation, inoculation in adults. In kids, it tends to be hematogenous spread. Usually the initial site is metaphyseal, and because of their abundant vascular surprise and supply, sorry, and the presence of large sinusoids at the metaphyseal epiphyseal junction, this is how it spreads hematogenously in kids. So you can have acute osteomyelitis, that's the first episode of infection. It can have a rapid presentation and then can obviously become chronic. Chronic osteomyelitis can be indolent for decades and it can convert from dormant to active without any known inciting event. What happens is the bacteria lodges in the bone in sufficient numbers to overwhelm the local defenses. You get osteoblast necrosis, activation of osteoclasts, release of inflammatory mediators, recruitment of inflammatory cells blood vessel thrombosis, and all of these can cause a purulent exit. This then can penetrate the uh, porous metaphyseal cortex in acute osteo hematogenous osteomyelitis, and you can get a subperiosteal abscess causing this subperiosteal elevation that you'll see in this uh, drawing, or this, uh, this picture illustrates a Codman triangle, which is this periosteal elevation. You also can see what's called a sequestrum, which is periosteal elevation deprives the underlying cortical bone of blood supply. So you end up with this radiodense necrotic segment of free devascularized infected bone sitting right inside of another bone. So you get this bone in bone sort of uh, appearance here. And involucrum then is caused by a release of cytokines from inflammatory cells. It stimulates osteoclastic bone resorption and ingrowth of fibrous tissue. You get deposition of reactive periosteal new bone, so you'll get a new bone forming on the outside, and it may surround the sequestrum. So you see here in this picture, there's a new uh, periosteal new bone reaction. There's a sequestrum right there. And then the final thing, we don't use this term very often, but you may see, sometimes you'll see this in radiology reports, they talk about a cloaca. That's an opening here in the involucrum, and that's when the purulent material and necrotic material starts to drain out. So what happens, you get this rupture of a subperial osseo abscess. It can lead to soft tissue abscess and eventual formation of the draining sinus. So this subperial osseo abscess will rupture and then this will then start to drain out here. And then you can see here's the new bone forming there, the dead bone forming around this, and then the sinus tract if it makes its way out. The most common pathogens are Staph aureus, responsible for 80 to 90% of osteomyelitis, Streptococcus, Enterococcus, Pseudomonas, and we all know that Salmonella is more common in people with sickle cell, but is the most common cause even in people with sickle cell is still Staph aureus. So what, why is this? Uh, staph may be protect, protected from host immune defenses. It excretes protein A, which inactivates immunoglobulin antibodies produces a capsular polysaccharide, so this reduces opsonization and phagocytosis, so you're not getting rid of this stuff. Biofilm secludes the organisms from the host defenses, and then this thing called a pantin valentine leukocytin PVL, is a cytotoxin that lyses white, white blood cells, so this can cause tissue necrosis. Its presence may be associated with increased virulence, so in staph that are more virulent, you may have more of this PVL. So basically you get the, then you'll develop a biofilm, which is defined as a community of bacterial cells, about 15% of this so-called community, embedded in self-generated protein polysaccharide complex. That's 85% of what you're seeing. It's referred to as extracellular poly polymeric substance or EPS. This strongly adheres to any inert or biologic substance. It is not water soluble, so you can't just irrigate it off and the bacteria in these biofilms becomes very resistant to higher antibiotic concentrations. So they'll spread along colonized surfaces and patients may show few signs of infection with these biofilms. The aspirates often have negative cultures because they're so protected and they have to be completely removed along with any infected biomaterials to truly eradicate infection. So how do you evaluate these people? 
Clinically, you'll us they'll usually present with a draining sinus or an abscess. In acute osteomyelitis, you might see exposed bone in a poor soft tissue envelope. In chronic, those two may then also be accompanied by chronic swelling and induration and cellulitis. Plain radiographs. In acute osteomyelitis, you're not going to see any changes for at least 10 to 14 days. It requires 30 to 40 percent of bone loss before any bony destruction is visible on x-rays. So x-rays are not a great way of diagnosing, but uh, you may see periosteal reaction. You see this onion skinning shown right here. Uh, you may also see areas of osteolysis, so you can see these uh, big loosened areas in uh, this distal tibia. And in the chronic osteomyelitis, you're going to see dense sclerotic bone. It looks very avascular. It looks just like dead bone sitting in there. So this really dense white bone that you see in the proximal third of the tibia. You may also see the actual sequestrum uh, on, or involucrum on your x-rays as well. You can also see what's called a Brody's abscess, which is an intraosseous abscess. It is uh, subacute, and so it's usually not diagnosed until... Uh, it breaks through the cortex. So here's an example of a proximal femur, and you can see that Brody's, or excuse me, the sequestrum sitting right there in the middle of this new bone that's forming on the outside of it. And then there just it is on the lateral view, and there you can actually see some onion skinning going on on this view. And then this went on uh, to develop this huge involucrum, this big. Uh, periosteal new bone formation along the medial side. The CT scan is best to show bony changes. You can see your sequester on a CT scan. You can also see the cortical disruption. So you see this a, a CT cut through this area of the bone and you can see the sequestrum right there and you can also see how the cortex is no longer uh, intact on the uh, coronal view there. The CT, though, is really best to show these sequestrum, cortical disruption, and your sclerotic bone. It has limited use in the actual workup of the osteomyelitis, but can help with surgical planning. It can also be used for a guided biopsy. Here's an example of a, uh, a, a biopsy right into the sequestrum, and you can see the needle going right in there. MRI is very useful for osteomyelitis, has 80 to 100% sensitivity. The change in signal intensity is due to the increased edema and water content. So on T1, you're going to see a decreased signal intensity with increased T2 signal intensity. And if you add gadolinium, so you get the MRI with contrast, you may see some rim enhancement. Here are just some examples of MRIs, both T1 and T2 imaging, so you can see the difference in how they look. And especially this is the same patient right here in the T1 and the T2 MRI, so you can see this osteomyelitic area right there. You can detect osteomyelitis within three to five days of onset with an MRI. You can also easily see necrotic bone, any sinus tracts, and bony abscesses much better than with x-rays or CT scan. For lab studies, you want to get a CBC with a differential ESR-CRP. Acutely, you may see an elevated white count, uh, platelet count actually, ESR-CRP, and a left shift. Chronically, labs are typically completely normal. The CRP and ESR are acute phase response markers. They can be elevated in infle infection or inflammation. And following the trends can be useful in moderating the response to your treatment, but if the absence of them doesn't uh, prove that there is no infection. ESR particularly is an indirect measure. It's affected by a variety of factors. It value increases with age. It can remain elevated for more than six weeks after surgery, so not that useful acutely rises within two days of onset infection, increases for three to five days after treatment initiated, and they'll normal, generally normalize after three to four weeks. CRP is more a direct measure. It will normalize within two to three weeks after surgery, so it can be used more acutely, increases within hours of infection, peaks within 48 hours, and can normalize within one week of treatment. So you can use these to start watching what's going on as you're treating these uh, patients. And what about our friend, the bone biopsy? We always get asked about this. One thing is that in order for it to be effective, you, the patient needs to be off antibiotics for at least three weeks. So usually that's our good out for uh, not doing the bone biopsy because usually when we get consulted, these patients have been on antibiotics. You need to take multiple samples from different sites and there's a low rate of positive cultures uh, in known osteomyelitis, most likely due to both sampling error and of course biofilm colonization. So this is blocked off.
So the real evaluation comes from intraoperative cultures. Tissue cultures are the gold standard. You need, uh, you always want to get both bacterial and fungal cultures. You also want a pathologic examination of all resected tissue because osteomyelitis is really both a microbiologic and a histologic diagnosis. When you're classifying these, uh, Cerny Mater is the classification that's still really stuck to after all these years, considers the anatomy of the bone involvement, also subclassifies the disease according to the physiologic status of the host, helps define the lesion and the host's ability to deal with the process, and also helps give you prognosis, uh, and where the prognosis is well correlated with the physiologic host subclassification. So what does all this mean? When you're treating these patients, you need to properly stage the host and bone involvement to develop appropriate treatment plans. The treatment can be influenced by the condition of the host, the functional impairment caused by the disease, the site of involvement, the extent of bony necrosis. So here's the Cerny Mater staging system for osteomyelitis. I'm not going to go through this, uh, you know, very uh, in a very detailed manner, but you can just see the four types are medullary, superficial, full thickness, no localized cortical involvement, and permeative infection. And then you see the different etiologies and the treatments, which we'll talk about a little bit more independently, but they all basically uh, have in common that you need to get rid of the osteomyelitis. And then here's just a diagrammatic uh, demonstration of, uh, of the Cerny Mater classification. Host classification, this is probably much more important. You have A host, B host, and C host. A host is a normal immune system, no contraindications to surgical treatment. A B host with a superscript L is local compromise. So you're gonna treat the underlying problems, then treat the osteo. So if there's problems with the soft tissue envelope, things like that, that's a local compromise. A B, uh, BS is the uh, a systemic compromise, and those are people where there's you also have to treat the underlying problems, but there's other things going on besides just the osteomyelitis systemically that are problematic. And then in a C host, these are people with severe systemic compromise where the treatment is worse than the disease. So these are ones you either do nothing or you just do chronic suppression. They're anything, any aggressive treatment is not gonna work in a C host. And then here again is just uh, looking at the treatment modalities based on the different types of osteomyelitis. And I just put this slide in so you can uh, you can explore it on your own uh, and review it, but this is just showing you the different uh, types of treatment that you're going to do depending on the type of osteomyelitis that you have. So what are your surgical indications? Because we always like to tell the medicine people that osteomyelitis is a, a medical problem, but it can be a surgical problem as well. If there's an abscess, if you have a chronic draining sinus, necrotic bone, or poor quality surrounding soft tissue, these are indications for surgical management you have to debride these things. You need aggressive, meticulous debridement. All infected and devitalized bone and soft tissue needs to be debrided, and this may require you to resect a large segment of bone. You also have to get rid of the avascular dense fibrotic scar. It doesn't matter how much bone you debreed, if the surrounding soft tissues are avascular, it's never gonna heal and the infection's never gonna go away. Excise any sinus tracts, make sure you get the whole tract. You don't just cut around it or through it. And then you need to debreed any atrophic or adherent skin uh, because, again, this also has a poor blood supply. You also have to remember that, although rare, malignant degeneration does happen, so you always want to send some of the skin for pathologic examination as well. <clears throat> so surgical treatments include saucerization. Any of you who've spent time with me at Bellevue know that we, we do this for osteomyelitis. You make a long, skinny trough in the bone. You debride the intramedullary canal aggressively, including excising any sequestrum. Because it's a long, skinny trough, it doesn't affect the integrity of the bone unless there's already underlying poor bone quality. Because remember, a united bone is three out of four cortices, so if you have about 270 degrees circumferentially of bone still intact, it should not affect the underlying uh, integrity of the bone. So here's an example, again, the same femur that we looked at before. Here's pre-op. You see the uh, sequestrum, the onion skinning. You can see the abscess, uh, uh, the subperiosteal abscess on the MRI. And then here it is postoperatively. So you see, again, this long skinny trough in the femur right there. Here's what it looks like on the MRI, but all of the stuff that was in the canal is now gone. Here's a, another one we saw earlier with the sort of patchy areas of, uh, of uh, bone that uh, have been infected here. 
And so again, saucerization, you see this long skinny trough, you see all of that debrided. And obviously because of this large defect here, this ended up getting an external fixator as well because this certainly was not a stable bone without anything additional uh, involved. And uh, then for uh, surgical treatment, you have to remember that you may need to use skeletal stabilization as was illustrated in those past two uh, examples. You can use short-term external fixation until you've got everything cleaned up and then uh, convert to internal fixation. External fixation can be used for definitive management. Antibiotic cement impregnated nails are very helpful as are uh, antibiotic coated plates. For defects less than two centimeters, you can do acute shortening. And then for larger defects, you may need to resort to uh, bone transport. You also need to manage the dead space. You've got to fill up this dead space created by the debridement with local rotational or free muscle flap. Vac sponges can be used short term to clean up the area. Also antibiotic beads made either out of PMMA or resorbable calcium sulfate or phosphate. And these can provide high dose local antibiotic delivery. So here again is an example of another saucerization with this long skinny trough in the proximal tibia. And here's a string of beads that are in there with a plan to go back and take those out later and graft. Here's another example, again, where you can see this, uh, this sequestrum right in the middle of the bone here. And then there's a sinus tract. This was breeded, packed with uh, PMMA uh, as a spacer and uh, antibiotic impregnated, of course, and then ultimately bone grafted and went on to heal to start from the small images that you see here and then to the larger healed image. And don't forget the soft tissue. You need a well-vascularized uh, coverage that's essential for healing. Microvascular free tissue transfer is still the gold standard. Rotational flaps can be tricky because oftentimes the surrounding soft tissue is involved in the osteomyelitis. If it's not, though, that's a great uh, solution as well. And what about antibiotics? Obviously, you need ID consultation. Uh, parental antibiotics, the duration is still controversial, anywhere from uh, four to six weeks, sometimes even you'll get two weeks and four weeks of PO, so which basically tells you we don't really know what the right answer is. Tradition, transition to oral antibiotics if it's appropriate and consider chronic suppression in C posts. So again, your treatment principles, individualized to the patient's condition. Your goals are to eradicate the osteomyelitis, preserve the soft tissue envelope, heal the bone, preserve the limb length and function.